Let's do the first one, so number nine. All right. Um, so if you add additional silver iodide, what happens? Well, it shifts to the right. It's a solid, so no change. It's a solid. Uh, the um, the thing that affects the reactivity is the concentration. If and so the the concentration of the solid doesn't change. It's the same. It's still pure. Do you know it because pure solids and pure liquids have an activity of one? It's fixed. And um, if it were liquid, it's the same thing. You know, you add more liquid, it doesn't change the concentration, and so it's not going to shift. So pure solids and pure liquids have no impact. You need it. If you don't have enough silver iodide to reach equilibrium, then that's a problem. But you, once you have enough, then adding more doesn't make any difference. It's like, okay, I, you know, you saturated your coffee with sugar, right? Is adding five more sugar cubes gonna make it sweeter once it's saturated? No, I mean, you could add more and more. You, know, you could add a ton of sugar, it's still not gonna get any sweeter because no more sugar is going to dissolve. Now, you could change the temperature. You know, one way we could do things is the case you know, the Ks depend on temperature. For example, we saw that for water. Remember when we're looking at water? When we're looking at water, Kw. Does the pH change with temperature? Yes, the pH changes with temperature for pure water. But, you know, that's a hassle because every day in our lab, the temperature changes depending on if the AC kicks off or doesn't kick off. And so do you want to follow the fluctuations and the pH changes? No. And so what people do is they just say, well, pure water is always going to have pH 7 no matter what the temperature is, even though that's not correct. And so they built pH meters to, to compensate for temperature. So we don't have to follow the fluctuations and compensate each time we do it otherwise. But for everything else, we do. I mean, if the temperature changed here, this is for room temperature, if the temperature changed here, it's totally different. So if that value was like three and below, or I mean, just like 8.5, and then the increase in temperature, you would expect it to favor products? Uh, yeah. I'd expect this one to favor products, but not all of them, you know, it depends. Um, on some some of them, um, some dissolution processes are actually endothermic, and so when you dissolve it, it actually gets cold, and so there you would favor um, reactants. But most most uh, dissolution processes are exothermic, or uh, no, most are endothermic. Well, whatever, you get the point. Yeah. Depends. All right, other, other questions? Uh, what was the other one after this, the activity? Yeah, it was just, is it the effective concentration? The activities are, did you, did you read that section I asked you guys to read in chapter 13? No, right, it's only two pages long. It was um, from chapter 13, what section was that? Yeah, uh, thirteen nine, right? Thirteen nine. Let me quote page five eighty seven. 
quote, the other is the effective concentration called the activity. I mean, basically, I wanted you to, to memorize one sentence out of that section. The other stuff is a little bit more complex, you know, and, and we aren't actually calculating them. So they give you a whole bunch of numbers there. We aren't. Okay. And then, not only that, but, you know, a little bit more about why it's a, a, the effective concentration and then not something else. What else? Mm -hmm. um, it was on the exam, the last one. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have to find the equilibrium concentration for a reason. Yes. And it was the iron to two plus. Um, basically, I don't really know how to get the S. Uh, what did you do? At first, I tried it the original way, but it gets. You like binaurals, and you get rid of that, I reset the whole thing. Okay. But it still didn't work. Well, it doesn't look like it worked because it just. Did you try it or you didn't really try it? I, well, I don't know if it's correct though, that's why. You can always tell if it's correct by double checking it. Do you, you guys know how to double check your answer? Oh, that's right, I did right there. And it, did, it wasn't the same. So then that's why I tried. Um, Um, what was the problem? It was um, Fe2 plus aqueous. Two of them. Yeah, two of them plus um, two H2 plus. And then two Fe3 plus aqueous plus H2 plus and then two on the bottom. H2 two. Mercury one. Did you did you guys do the homework? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All of them? Yes. Okay. See, KC is nine point one four times ten to the minus six. For that one, it's one point oh nine times ten to the fifth. One point oh nine times ten to the fifth. Okay. One point oh nine times ten to the fifth. All right, I handled this question yesterday, too. Um, you guys figured it out? I did successfully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? <laughs> you got it, successive approximation, successfully? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. A million times? I got it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine times. And, and then you got it with nine guesses? Yeah. Wow, good. Good. Yeah, it depends. You know, sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. But, you know, a problem like this is not so easy. Uh, did you do a double check? I, I did, but the, because it's, it comes up to be like one over one. But you'll see. Did you did double check? It's all for what you think actually. Uh -huh. Since that's already plugging it in, like, uh, like trying to find what it's equal to and how you well, back in the original the, you're right. You're right. What I mean by double check is how close did you get? Did you get it to where it rounds off to 1.09 times 10 to the fifth? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. 1.08. 1.08. And then you, you, you got 1.094 times 10 to the eighth. And what was your, um, what was your value? 0 0.04613. 0 0.04613 for your X. All right. But do you do the successive approximation um, after? Is a successive approximations should work for most problems. What, what, what problem was this? Was this like the? Was this on the practice test? Was this the last problem? Yeah. Oh, okay. Was this the problem you were asking me about yesterday? No. No, different one. Yeah. You asked me about this. Okay. Um, yeah, the, okay, successive, well, 1.09, what did you get, 1.08, Scott, something, 1.08? Yeah. Yeah, those, those are close. The 1.094 is fine, you can do that, you know, do that. Hmm? Even the reset is the 
What, what were the um, what were the initial conditions here? Point one hundred on the two way. Point one hundred. Yeah. And point one hundred. Yes. Zero. Zero zero. So if successive approximations uh, works, then that's good. Well, successive approximations, you would expect to work on every problem, but it doesn't. It doesn't because it's hard to get it to converge on some kind of answer. And so when, when, you, when you see it's going to be a long, drawn-out road and you don't have enough time, then you start looking for tricks you can do, right, to make things easier. And so how many tricks do you have up your sleeve, let's say? You know, how many, how many um, tricks can you, can you come up with? You know, a lot of people just have zero, you know. But, uh, uh -huh. Question, can you change HG, the mercury one, to two atoms, mercury one above three? No, no, you can't because the, the, it's covalently bonded together. Okay. So it's not split. If it were split, then it would be like, like twice the concentration. Um, so it's going to be half the concentration when it's bound in like that. Yeah, so that's impossible to split. The diatomic ion. So, um, uh, so a problem like this, though, you know, um, after you start getting comfortable, like uh, David, let's say, what would you do in, in solving this problem? Would you solve it as is, or what would you do? As is, um... or would you change it right right away? But did everybody solve it as is? That sounds good. So you assume full forward reaction, and then we'll get a new set of initial. So the, 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 you assume full forward rea reaction. What's that, what's that called? Reset. reset. So we'll just reset it. Why would you reset it to the right? Because k is large. You know, uh, this problem I wouldn't have even bothered doing it this way. I would have reset it automatically. You know. Uh, with me, I, I think it's, a, uh, it's beneficial, quite beneficial in this because the K is 10 to the 5th, which is pretty big. You know, it's not like 10 to the 10th or 10 to the 18th. Kelly, you have a question? When, the, when he do, okay, when the successive approximation fails? When successive approximations fails is... <laughs> um, when yeah, when you're basically uh, your calculator is going to run out of digits, you know, if if I make the number small enough, which I can easily do. I mean, I can easily make it fail. Your calculator is going to how many how many digits is it going to be able to carry? You know, max max digits is going to be nine or ten. It's so easy. I can make my x like no, I no, I can make it point nine 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 eight. Out of 0. 0.100, so 99.9999998% change, and your calculator is going to round it to 0. 0.1. Even if you have a programmable calculator, which which I let, you know, this this department policy didn't come in until uh, recently, but I used to allow programmable calculator. I didn't care if they used programmable calculators because I'll just make the problem too hard for your. I mean, not too hard, but just too many digits that your calculator can't handle it. And therefore, it's it's worthless, you know. Anyway, so that's what got me thinking about this whole thing, about this because of programmable. I didn't want to make it fair. I mean, unfair to the people who didn't have programmable calculators, right? And so I had to make a problem that uh, that it would fail, right? And so uh, anyway, um, it's easy to make successive approximations fail. It's easy. And therefore, you have to know some tricks. Otherwise. You aren't going to solve it. Uh huh. So, uh, could you show how, if you do reset it, what if it's two to one like that? Is, is it double or? Is it no. Okay. Uh, well, y all you do is you just do this. Uh, it, 
when you reset, I use y. So I do minus 2y minus 2y. And then you have to figure out what the limiting reagent is here. And so in this case, it's stoichiometric. There's no limiting reagent. So y must be half of that. So you know it's going to go to 0. We're just going to lose all of this. So it's just pushing all the atoms. This is like pushing all the water. We have a Let's say we have 200 gallons of water on the left. We're just going to move all 200 gallons from the left side to the right side. And so we're going to end up with zero gallons of water on the right. And then we're going to have all 200 gallons on, on the left. And so this is going to be plus 2y. But over here, this is going to be plus y, not plus 2y. And so plus 2y, this is going to give me 0.100 molar. And plus y, this is going to give me 0.050 or 500 molar if you did three six figs. Now you might think, well, what happened to the 200 gallons? Because I only, it looks like I only have 150 gallons, but that's not correct because what happened was the mercury is now doubled up here because it's diatomic mercury and you still have all the atoms there. We didn't lose any atoms and we didn't create any atoms, right? And so all the atoms are there. We just pushed them. This is like pushing all the water molecules. All the water molecules are still there. They're just on the right side now instead of the left side. This is called reset. The, the problem, every semester I have this problem, so maybe I have this problem because people say, oh, the reset's not in the book, right? It's not in the book, therefore we shouldn't do it. Um, and therefore you shouldn't make us expect to do it, right? But the problem is, is, yeah, it's not in the book, but Petrucci uses reset all the time. You don't notice it because it's subtle. I mean, he'll, he'll, he'll do it a different way. For example, when we say K is large, on that chart, there are actual K values for the strong acids. But when we say K is large here, do you know what we're doing? When you say K is large, you're, you're resetting. That's what you're doing because what you're going to do after K is large is you're going to figure out what the actual equilibrium is. And so uh, the, the, the numbers there, we aren't going to use it. There are actual numbers there, and you can actually do the calculations, but that would be multiple equilibria, and it'd be a lot tougher, right? It's much easier just to reset it. And so that's why they say K is large, and rather than give you the numbers, because you can look up every single number on that K is large thing. And so this is how to get people who don't want to do this resetting stuff to do it. But you know, we, we don't have to just do it for the strong acids. We could do it for all the problems and make them easier, right? And so I, I have a lot of resistance for this whole business about reset because, um, you know, there's not a, a, a chapter or section about resetting. Um, but when you look at the solutions guide and you look at how they solve a lot of the problems, that's exactly what they're doing. Uh-huh. Why do we have to use the simplifying assumption? I use it all the time, it, and then if it fails, it fails. If it works, it works. You know, it doesn't take much time to do the simplifying assumption. But the thing is, like, why do we reset? Why do we reset to the side that's favored is so that the simplifying assumption works? Because if we left it on this side, the change is going to be huge, right? If we leave it on this side, the change is going to be small. And so um, now you just do this change in the equilibrium. So I, I don't understand why this didn't work on the reset. This should work easily on the reset. It, it shouldn't be that hard of a problem because now it's just going to be plus 2x, plus 2x, minus 2x, minus x. And so at equilibrium, we've got 2x molar, 2x molar, 0.100, minus 2x molar, 0.0500 minus x molar. And so Kc is going to be um, 0.100 minus 2x times 0.0500 minus x over 2x squared squared which would be 2x to the fourth. Oh yeah, this one should be squared too. So when do you use the simplifying? All the time. I use it all the time. I, you know, I don't even check. In chapter 16, they say check the ratio. I don't even bother checking the ratio. Let's just try it. Let's see if it works, it works. If it fails, it fails. I don't want to calculate any ratio. The ratio is between K and the initial. That added 
couple of minutes to come. So I just do the simplifying assumption to saying 2x is gonna be smaller than 0.100, x is gonna be smaller than 0.05, which means this is gonna be 0.100 squared, 0.0500 over you know, two to the fourth is what, two times two is four times two is eight times two is 16, 16x to the fourth, is that right? And then just solve for x. It doesn't take that much time, so it's easier than solving the ratio. I don't want to think, is it going to fail or is it not going to fail because it's uncertain. I'll just try to see. And then just calculate x. What's that? Yeah, yeah, no, we don't plug the x back in here. We do plug it in back here in the original, but we'll check the concentrations better because we can see we did some kind of subtraction error or addition error. And so just solve for x. Um, it's 0.1 squared times 0.05 divided by 16 divided by 1.09 times 10 to the fifth. And what do you get? Point. Times 10 to the negative 10. But before we do the double check, what do we have to do? We have to we have to justify it, right? Yeah, we need to calculate the percent change. And so the percent change is going to be the same in both, but 2x relative to 0.1 is the same as an x relative to half of that. And so uh -huh. Yeah, uh, it's actually point zero zero four eleven. Yes. Yeah. Okay, what did you get? Point zero zero four eleven. Zero zero four one one. All right. Um, when we do this, the the change, we'll just double this. So this is gonna be point double oh eight. This will be point double oh eight. 8 over 0.100 times 100%. So this is going to be 822. Wait, how can I get 16 times 4? 2x to the 4. 2x to the 4, so that means 16 times. Yeah, 2 to the 4th, x to the 4th. And so 2 to the 4th is 16. This is 2 times 2. But you assume x is. We assume x is what? It's much less than what? Um, oh, for the simplifying assumption? Mm -hmm. uh, x is much less than 0.05. That's what we're saying. Let's hope it's OK. It's 8%, unfortunately. So this is 8.2%. Eight point two percent is fail. So uh, there was a chance it would have worked, but it didn't work, which leaves us with no choice. Uh huh. From from either from here or from. The original setup, we would do successive approximations. But because we know that um, if x equals to 0 0.0411, we can go off of that, though, right? Yeah, this would be our first guess for successive yeah. approximations. And then we would adjust this. Right, we would adjust this. In there. You got 0 0.02, what was it? 0 0.04. 0 0.04? Yeah, it's way, way off. Well, I, I wouldn't have expected it to be that far off because this was only 8%, but, but it's off. So unfortunately, you've got to do successive approximations. It's a grind, but there's no other choice. Okay. If it worked, we would have just made it a much simpler problem, but it didn't. But it's still worth doing because it often works. All right, other, other questions? So, so
All right, sodium and magnesium, what was the question? So you gotta do successive approximations, but you know, successive approximations is just time consuming, but um, eventually you'll get close. I mean, 1.094 would have been no problem. 1.08 would have been, you know, I don't remember what I did, what I did with the points. But depends on how many guesses you did. All right, well, what's the magnesium or whatever it is? Zinc is. There's a question. Oh, it's a. Uh, oh, it's a change. I, I, well, the reason I did it is so I could do it in my head. You know, 8 out of 100 versus 4 out of 50, you know. 4 out of 50 is still 8%. I just did it. You could do it with either one because both of these are the same relative change. What was the question? Was it from the practice test, Scott? Yeah, um, the yeah. equation for my good behavior significant for online or then maybe All right, this is where you have to read the section a, a little bit more, chapter 13, the section in chapter 13. You have to look at the table and then, you don't, you know, when you look at a table like this, oh, we have a projector here. Turn it on. No, forget it. Um, when you look at a table like the one in chapter thirteen, um, you you just try to you know what you try to do you try to come up with like a one sentence take home set, you know message or take home point right or maybe more than one sentence. So you take a look at a table like this, table uh, 13, 3, and then try to come up with a one sentence take home point. What was the one sentence take home point from table 13, 3? Did anybody do that? This is why, you know, this is why. Um, <clears throat> This is why, you know, when I, when I did my notes, I didn't just write my notes, right? What I did was, when I took lecture notes, and did you know, like at UCs, you can buy lecture notes? Did you know they have a business? You actually buy uh, lecture notes for popular classes. And the student gets paid and sits there with you, takes notes, meticulous notes. But even, even if you buy those notes, you know, I'd never just read those notes. You know what I would do? For every subject, I would write a little take home point or take home message. This is what I need to get from this or this is what I got from this, you know? And so a, a table like this, you know, tables, I, I'd say, okay, th this is what I, I, what I see, the pattern that you see. What is the pattern that you see in the table? The, the pattern that I, uh-huh. It was the uh, time grade of the school with a single college. It, um, it's usually the limiting the two grade for the single school. No, not, not exactly. The, 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 the point I see here is that the ions with a higher charge deviate more from ideal behavior. Why do the ions with higher charge deviate more from ideal behavior? It's because of this. This figure here, oops, which is this figure down here, figure 1120, why would ions deviate more? It's because of stronger ion-ion attractions, you know, which will reduce the effective concentration. So there I took like two pages and summarized it into two sentences, you know. That's what, the, that's what you should do too, you know, to get the get the point. And so the lecture, I don't do this for the lectures. You, you should do it because this is how you remember it. You put it in your own words and then you remember it. But it, to, to memorize somebody else's words is, doesn't have the same impact, doesn't have the same meaning. You know, It's much better if you put it in your own words, which I don't want to do it for you. You should do it for yourself. All right, so the, the question about um, that, magnesium versus sodium, then it, it the, uh, the ions is this. 
The difference is sodium ions are plus one, magnesium ions are plus two. Which one is going to deviate more? Magnesium two plus. Why? Because they're going to have stronger ion ion attractions. You know? And so uh, if there's a sulfate around, then what happens is they pair. This is why, have you heard of, heard of, um, HF is about a million times weaker of an acid than HCl. Why is HF a million times weaker than HCl? Is it because, um, is, oh, okay, it has a million times shorter bond and therefore a million times stronger bond? So the bond in HCl is about uh, 400 kilojoules per mole, but the bond in, um, bond in HF is 400 million kilojoules per mole. 400 million kilojoules per mole, you'd need a, what, what, what kind of photon would you need for that? The bond would not break. Beyond gamma, beyond cosmic, and there's no such photon with that high of energy because it might annihilate the universe. <laughs> What's that? You know why HF is a million times weaker? I know a lot of you, we're, we're, we're coming to this in chapter 16. I'm going to review this as well. But um, at the end of chapter 16, we talk about structure and acidity. It's supposed to be, this is supposed to be a topic covered in Chem 1A. You know, structure and acidity, but it, it, it's because of ion pairing, ion pairs. Ion pairs is what causes uh, ideal solutions to deviate from, I mean, um, not ideal, so it's what causes uh, real solutions to deviate from ideal behavior, because ideal behavior, there's no interionic attraction. Just like ideal gases, there are no intermolecular forces of attraction. But in real solutions, there's interionic attraction. So the higher the concent the other take home point, as I said, one or two sentences, the other take home point is the higher the concentration, the worse things deviate from ideal behavior. Because the higher the concentration, the ions are closer together and they have more uh, opportunity to interact with each other. So those are the um, summary. And so the, the question was, which one deviates more from ideal behavior or something like that? Yeah. Okay, then magnesium does. Magnesium. All right, um, other questions? Well, no, the, it's not why it's hydrochloric. Hydrochloric follows the pattern. Hydrochloric, hydroidic, hydrobromic follows a nice pattern. Hydrofluoric is, did you say hydrofluoric or hydrochloric? Oh, okay, you're right. Hydrofluoric is the one that deviates. No, you probably don't. The reason is, is because it doesn't break apart completely. HCl. 100% dissociates. HF does not 100% dissociate, or it just partially dissociates. And so if it partially dissociates, it forms what we call an ion pair. This paired interaction means that the H plus isn't free to react with bases. H plus is kind of stuck to the fluoride. And then there's one additional step. You've got to break this attraction because this attraction is kind of strong to finally free up the H plus. So because of this ion pair, uh, makes HF a weak acid. Even though HF is a weak acid, you know, you don't treat it like acetic acid, like any other weak acid, because HF has very nasty metathesis properties. It's a fluoride. Fluoride um, will attack your bone. And so if you, if you spill strong acid, it's going to burn, right? You spill weak acid, it doesn't burn that much, you know, vinegar or whatever else. HF doesn't burn that much until it hits the bone. When it hits the bone, it penetrates through the flesh, then it causes excruciating pain, which can lead to death and has led to death. But, you know, it's not something you can wash off because it's already penetrated through your flesh and started attacking your bone. And so, um, 
people who work with a lot of HF, you know, like the electrical engineers and stuff, they, uh, on the wall they have a um, you know, calcium, calcium injection kit. It's like calcium glutamate or calcium, there's some, you know, some organic anion. Huh? You have to get that needle in your bone? No, no, you get in your blood. You get in your blood and, and the, the calcium is supposed to precipitate out with the fluoride to make calcium fluoride. Calcium fluoride is insoluble. And, uh, lower the, the fluoride concentration in your blood. I don't know. I don't think you should. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, then you're, yeah, that's right. You're, you're the expert on this stuff. Well, I mean, uh, you're, you're the knowledgeable one. Right. So the, the uh, you know, the, at the, the electrical engineering department is very interesting because the, you have a lot of electrical engineers. They don't have much wet chemistry technique. And then they have to do a lot of etching and use wet chemicals. And then at UCSB, at the, in the electrical engineering department, they have the wall of horrors. In every single accident, they take pictures of. And so they're pretty gruesome pictures there of some of the accidents that occurred there. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, check that out. It, well, you know, that was when I was there. And so I would always, uh, when I, sometimes I go out there and I always take a look at the wall of horrors to see if there are any new postings there. Maybe they have it online now. Yeah. Well, if you want to see some horrors, take, take a look. I, although they took it down. Um, there's um, one of the main um, manufacturers of HF. I can't remember. I, I have it. I, I usually show it in, in Chem 1A. I don't know if I showed it last semester. Uh, but um, they have this, um, like this uh, medical guide for this. And so they, they show a whole bunch of HF burns, you know. And so they're nasty. And so um, really graphic. You can take a look at that. It's, it's what was it, Honey? Was it Honeywell? Yeah. It might be Honeywell, even though they mostly make electronic stuff, but uh, I think of uh, chemical it, yeah. Yeah. It's it's Honeywell. But they took it down for so it was up for a while. Uh, the most gruesome ones. Now they have some kind of uh, you know, edited version of that. Yeah. 